Good morning. The, the Research Center is, a, is an incredibly prolific uh, organization, but I like to think I have one of the funnest jobs at the Research Center. I design experimental buildings. And one of the reasons that's so uh, incredible is because they send me to some of the most difficult environments uh, in the North and in the world to solve architectural problems. And the other reason it's incredible is because when your solutions work, they call you an architect, and when they don't work, they call you a researcher, which, is a, which is, lets you be pretty brave. Uh, what you're looking at here is the roof of one of our experimental prototypes that we built in Anaktuvik Pass, uh, northern Alaska, and I'll be speaking a bit about that. This is the roof of an entirely different building. This is the roof of the old Diamond High School, uh, where I went to high school here in Anchorage, Alaska. And this is from a time when we were new in oil money, and there was not enough design professionals that understood the North to meet the demand of our growing population. So basically, this is a building designed by a Californian firm, like a Californian high school, that has a group of uh, outbuildings, uh, and originally didn't have breezeways, and then from either a crisis of conscience or a lawsuit, they decided to put these, these breezeways in afterwards. Architecture schools are always just trying to decide what types of architects they want to produce, you know, classicists or modernists. If you really want your future architects to be militant regionalists, then all you've got to do is trap them for the entirety of their puberty in a leaky, cold building. Uh, and, and that's basically what you're going to come up with. So that's what, I, that's what I was originally drawn to architecture for, was I was interested in antagonistic physical environments. I wanted to go to the coldest places. I wanted to look at the strangest type of permafrost foundation scenarios. I wanted to think, if the environment was a place that could kill you, how would that environment shape the buildings that you live within? And so I started in places like Antarctica, trying to decide how these buildings might look based on just strictly physical parameters. And that's a great mental exercise, and it's a lot of fun, and you can learn a lot about uh, new technologies and, uh, and about uh, innovative approaches. But it kind of ends up being a little esoteric, right? Because this is, this is kind of where it leads you to. This is a famous design competition from the 70s that Frey Otto won, which was for an Arctic settlement. And basically, that line of thinking got us to the point where the ideal Arctic settlement was a temperate city with a bubble over it, so we wouldn't have to experience the Arctic at all. Uh, and, and that's not how we live in the North, you know? The people that have thrived and, and really lived well in the North were part of their physical environment. And one of the things that I think people are most surprised by when they move here is how much time Northerners spend outside and how integrated with the landscape uh, Northerners are. And so as opposed to, you know, creating these kind of bubbles of Antarctic moon stations, I try to think of how our, our Arctic environment has shaped our culture, and then how our culture could in turn shape the spaces that we live in. And that's both at, a, at the level of a building and at the level of a community. So I'm going to talk about this prototype here. This is an experimental home that we built in the village of Ant Anaktuvik Pass, uh, which is in the Brooks Range. It's a village of 300 people. And basically, they hadn't been able to build a house for 10 years by conventional methods, because the conventional uh, method of financing was difficult for people that had uh, not all like permanent income because they wanted to be available for the subsistence season. It was difficult for foundation design. And so we started with, with basically how people lived in this community. And uh, in the top right here is the mayor uh, of Anaktuvik Pass, or was the mayor, George Paniak. And he talked about how he used to live in this valley and how they would live part of the year in sod igloos and part of the year in, uh, in skin tents, and they would follow the caribou herds. And, and then somewhere along the time he was in his 20s, they started living in houses up on stilts. And he said something that I've actually heard other people from rural Alaska say. He said, when we were in the, in the old way of living, we lived in the earth where it was warm, and then we raised our dead up in the air. And then someone came along and told us that was uncivilized. And they, now we put our dead in the ground, and we live up on stilts in the wind. And we've been cold ever since. <laughs> so he says, you know, this is the way we want to live. Can you solve the technical details to make that possible? And so then this is, a, this is an incredible design problem. How do we do that? How do we arrange our spaces 
according to our client's needs. Not so different than, say, a, a, like a luxury housing market, you know? And one of the differences is they don't want a single thermal envelope. You know, you don't want your, you walk into a house in Anchorage and your bedroom's in your kitchen and your bathroom and everything's the same size and you're even mad if your toilet seat's a little bit different temperature than the rest of your house. But that's not necessarily how all people in rural Alaska want their living space. What, what George was explaining to us in some of the other villages is they really want a place that's extra cold. And that way they never have to plug in a freezer when it's 50 degrees below zero outside, which makes sense to me. And so we, we try and make a place for cold storage. Then they want a cool place where they can store outdoor gear. Because if you keep going warm to cold, warm to cold, the life of that gear is shortened. It's also, if it's 40 degrees below zero when you bring your snow machine into a hot garage, then it condenses in the muffler. The final thing is they wanted a hot living environment, not a 64 degrees, but like a 73 degree living environment. And George said, you know, the common belief is why be warm when you can be hot? <laughs> One of the things we needed to help work on with the village is subsistence storage is a huge issue. And you can't store subsistence goods in a regular Western kitchen. Unlike most of our pioneer towns, which are based on, you know, where's the best place to mine for gold, where's the best place to dig for coal, where's the best place to, you know, get 3G service or 4G service. Most of the villages that have been in Alaska for thousands of years are where they are because that's where it's good to eat. It's where the food is. And so if you're going to create a domestic space for people, you have to create a domestic space that reflects this. So subsistence storage is a huge part of the housing uh, design. This house was built with local labor so that we could train the local labor about how to use these different types of technologies that we were thinking could, uh, could be implemented in the far north. It was built in five weeks and uh, didn't cost any more than a, than a regular house in this region. This is the second prototype that we just finished this fall. This is in uh, the yukon Kuskokwim Delta, which is, as most of you know, is a completely different physical environment than the far north. It's flat, it's very wet, it's, uh, it's riverine, it's got incredible wind speeds, uh, you've got snow drifting issues, a, a whole different set of issues. And so what we wanted to do is create a home that fit the YK Delta. And what they wanted was not a linear design. What they wanted was a more radial design, a more centralized design that that kind of reminded them of the dwellings that used to have meaning uh, in the region. So there's still, there still living memory of these, of these types of dwellings. And so we had, we had technical goals, right? We want to lower the surface area to volume because we want less skin exposed to these crazy winds uh, per floor area. We also want to be able to work in small villages that don't have a squirt boom or don't have a large crane. And so we have to have small pieces of materials that can be assembled together by hand. And they, they definitely wanted culturally a central family area. What they didn't want and what they have in some of their homes is these long hallways. Uh, and in, in a lot of Western uh, housing plans, that's a, that's a type of privacy. You know, that's your private space when you're a, you're a kid or when you're, you know, if your parents, you want to get away from your kids or something like that. But, but what the folks in Quinnahawk wanted was they didn't want a wayward uncle or a teenager keeping themselves away from the family. What was most important was that every bedroom door opened into the central living space, and that reinforced this family dynamic. The other thing that we wanted was two heating sources. I'm amazed at how many buildings in a place where the physical environment can kill you depend on one heating source. And that's something that we always advise against. Uh, and finally, we want a buffer against these winds. This southeast wall is the wall that failed in almost every house in the village, and it's because it's got this incredible wet wind that rots the walls. It's very difficult to combat tectonically by, you know, through, your, through your assemblies because it's just, there's never going to dry. However, you can't, like Anaktuvik Pass, just orient yourself into the wind because in the YK, it switches direction on you. Uh, in, the, in the winter, it'll go from the north. And so orientation is a problem. So instead, we've got this kind of round, faceted design 
And then in the wet wall, we wrap the Arctic entryway around the building. Arctic entryways are a great idea. Uh, they used to be really long and involve moving up into the house so they would trap cold air uh, low. And then today, we still have what we call Arctic entries, but really they're only about this big, so that when you are opening the inner door, the outside door is still open, and they're on the same level, and it all, all the air comes in. And so what do we do in an Arctic entry today? We just pump mechanical heat into the small space. Uh, and, and this is kind of a step backwards. Also, the Arctic entry fun functions as a place to store food. And so we wanted to wrap a long Arctic entry, and what this does is it leans into the wind. And this is a sacrificial wall. I don't care if this gets wet. It's protecting this wall. And that, and that tempers the outdoor environment and also lengthens the, the life of the house. They also wanted their house on the ground, which is difficult for architects because permafrost is a huge issue. You, you get something on the ground that leaks heat and the, the building starts to go cattywampus in the first freeze thaw season. You also get buildings that get buried completely with snow uh, because the, the buildings on piles allow for the scouring action of snow. And so if, if you have a community that wants to go back to living on the ground, you've got to think of some pretty heavy problems. And what we decided to do was include our structural system with our insulation system. So the, the system for holding the building up off the ground is the system for keeping the heat in the house. And this is, uh, so far, this is working great. It forms a giant diaphragm that'll span any irregularities in the permafrost. The other thing is, if you want an open plan, how do you get away with that on permafrost with no columns? And so what we did here was we invented a hub. Uh, I like to call it the Jesus nut, like on, a, like on a helicopter. And it takes the bottom cords of all the trusses and puts them into tension. And that does two things. One, it makes all my trusses half the size that they were going to be to span so I can fit them on a plane. And the other thing is that it allows you to go from this which is a temporary, uh, temporary shoring to this, which is an open plan on permafrost, uh, which is an incredible way to organize your space because then the people that live in the home can organize their interior partitions in the way that feels most right to them. These walls, because they're only 14 foot sides, are able to be lifted by four men. And basically what they're made of is steel studs with a little Greek lattice like you see at Greek restaurants or something like that uh, and then the walls held off and we spray it full of soy based polyurethane foam. So there's a three inch complete insulatory break in the entire building. It's a complete membrane. There's no spots that are going, there's nothing that touches the inside wall that is also touching the outside wall. And there's always a little left over and so everybody benefits. One of the first things you learn in the village is nothing goes to waste. As far as drifting, these are some of the drifting problems we're fighting against, orientation and complete drifting over, but I uh, just got this picture. It's, a, it's kind of a bad picture, but it's a cell phone image from a guy in the village he just sent me last week. And you can see that the natural geometry of the building is created. This looks like somebody shoveled it, you know? I mean, it's great. It's basically, as soon as it gets to the point where it might be depositing leeward snow against the building, it turns another corner because the walls are only 14 feet. And the geometry alone allows the wind to, to scour the building, and so you're never going to get buried. So the thing about architecture is it's never, it's never happened until it's built, and so you've got to be continuously building these prototypes and testing them and seeing what's working. Uh, and so these are the villages right now where we have prototypes in the works, where we're testing different environments, uh, trying to test a rainforest model in Heidelberg, trying to test YK models, trying to get up there in the north in the various environments and see what works and see what doesn't work. From that, when we talk about the scale of the building, we can talk about the scale of the city. Uh, and one of the things that we're doing, just like we used to bring, say, a housing design from Seattle and put it in Barrow and be surprised when it didn't work, we're also bringing urban development schemes from large temperate cities and trying to put them in villages. And this is kind of what you get. You know, we've structured our grid in some of our villages that for the next two generations, our children will be forced to locate their homes based entirely on where they can defecate. Uh, and as humans, we should be smarter than that. And so instead of creating these mass 
infrastructures for as if it were a city of a million people, we're looking into different ways of handling waste. And generally, the rule of architecture is the less your client wants to think about something, the more you have to, so I think about poop all the time. Uh, you've got to figure out how to make sure that no one ever sees it, that, it never, that the toilet's always working, that things, are, that things are working exactly how they're supposed to. So we're handling sewage at the, at the level of the individual building. What that means is that building can go anywhere. It doesn't have to be on the grid. It can go wherever the native allotment is, wherever the best uh, access to the river is, wherever, you, wherever the road goes. And, where, and roads are another thing that uh, cause us problems. You can see here how much this road has affected the permafrost. Just in this area, wherever the road drains is where the permafrost melts. And yet, we used to know here that the best place to build a house was on the center of these ice wedge polygons themselves, you know, because that was the natural drainage and that affected the natural melting regime of the permafrost. Today, though, what we do is we build a grid. I'm amazed at every village I go to that's got a grid as if it were Omaha, Nebraska, that completely ignores the topography of the house or the topography of the land. When what we could be doing is placing our houses in the center of these ice wedge polygons. And then when the water runs off the roof, it's running towards the natural drainage capacity of that polygon. And with our roads themselves, instead of building them up, there's some really interesting things going on. This is the village of Newtok, where they're using a dura-based mat that sits lightly on the tundra. And this avoids the problem of paying a million dollars a mile for a town with three cars in it. What we really do need, and what I'd like to move towards, uh, apart from these rural uh, examples is kind of a database of all the amazing things going on in the state because there are some incredible designers in Alaska right now that are solving these problems along with the research center. This is an independent home builder in Fairbanks that has kind of an urban model of a passive house. This house doesn't use any fossil fuels to heat itself, which is tough enough in Arizona, but doing it in Fairbanks takes some heavy math. And, and it's working. It's an incredible building. Uh, this is a greenhouse that's about to start up in Manly Hot Springs. Uh, Manly and China Hot Springs are both getting involved in vegetable, vegetable production to handle food sources in places where the growing season is so short. You can have a growing season of 25 weeks if you're on top of a hot springs. And then finally, I head over to Russia from time to time. This is a, this is a really cool area of Salhard, which is a city about the size of Fairbanks on the Arctic Circle that has a spot where rural and urban infrastructure can meet up. There's an outdoor market for the reindeer herders that live in this area that they can plug into the conventional indoor Russian market and sell goods. And these are the kinds of things that I'd love to be thinking about here. Uh, because otherwise, you end up with this stuff. You just end up with these giant uh, kind of uh, monuments that don't necessarily reflect where we live. Russia's got an amazing set of people solving a pretty amazing set of problems. They've got a decaying infrastructure, they've got a harsh physical environment, and they're trying to figure out new ways to do it. And I'm really jealous of that because, you know, I work in rural areas, and where am I going to find a, a true northern metropolis with a decaying infrastructure or an aging infrastructure and that's almost reached the capacity to heat itself properly with fossil fuels? You know, I mean, those don't grow on trees or anything. So if you find one place, if you think of a place, you know, uh, let us know. Right now, uh, we're organizing a, an addition to allow these designers that are doing wonderful things to come meet at the research center and talk about what they're doing. And uh, you're invited. Come on by uh, and, uh, and see us. Thank you.